Almost from its invention, the motor car has inspired drivers to compete. The enduring challenge to go faster. On road, track or salt flat, speed has led the way to glory. Well, in one word, if you haven't got the speed, you don't win. It's as simple as that. And it's a skill that matures, it's a skill that you have to harness, you have to learn, and you nurture. You can't force it. It'll either come naturally or it won't come at all. And it depends then to what parameters you can push that speed as to how good you'll be. The fun is in going fast. I mean, anytime you can strap yourself into a 4,000 horsepower car and, and, you know, shoot it off off the starting line with the front wheels in the air and you go from zero to 100 miles an hour in, in like 60 feet, that's exciting. When you're driving, you are risking. There's no difference. Of course, if a dr some drivers have accident, every time they drive is because they are doing it wrong. They are taking the risks, but they are taking the wrong risks. It's like threading a needle. And to do it right, you must really, you know, have it together, have, you know, really know what you're trying to do. The concentration factor is just paramount and like no other place because things happen so fast. You climb something like kilometer and a half, nearly a mile, during that 20 kilometers, and there are, I think, over 150 corners, and still the average speed is uh, about 120 kilometers an hour. It's a real, uh, I think, ultimate test of the speed, and, and gives, if you get it right, the ultimate pleasure and uh, the sweet taste in your mouth. Try to picture this, front end two feet in the air, cars moving out there, the grandstands are a blur, you see nothing. Okay, you're looking at a little tiny window and your whole life is contained in this, I call it a coffin sometimes because it can be, but you're looking out that window. Now how do you think in five seconds trying to beat an opponent? And it's all reaction, you get out the other end sometimes, I don't even know if I hit the parachutes, I just get out and say, thank God I'm here. The ultimate challenge, the right to call yourself the fastest man on earth, is the official land speed record. Currently it's 633 miles an hour in thrust two. 28 men have held the record, five have died attempting it. For many, breaking it became an obsession. When you get involved with these world's record attempts, they are very demanding and I will never forget the words that were said to me by my dear old friend Leo Villa. He said, boy, there's two things I want to tell you. He said, first of all, think very carefully, because if you ever start, you will never be able to leave it alone. And secondly, however long you're at it, you will never get used to the atmosphere. And on both counts, dear old Leo Villa was absolutely right. Nowadays, there are two records, one for wheel-driven, the other for thrust-powered vehicles. Spirit of America was the first jet to break the record, when Craig Breedlove brushed with death. down somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 and fired my emergency chute and of course it, it was gone and uh, at that point uh, you know I really knew I had a problem. He's approaching the two. Man, he's really moving. He's past the two. Okay, I see him coming. He's out of control. 
and then skipped across this pond that they had and ended up submerged in a canal and had to swim from the car. And that, of course, uh, received, that's, you know, that's what made me famous. <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> what a ride. Go <laughs> for my next trick. <laughs> The rules governing a land speed record are detailed and precise. They were formalized in 1924 after years of controversy while the record rose from 39 miles an hour to 146. To be officially recognized, the record must be the average of two timed runs, one in each direction, through a measured mile or kilometer. In the 20s, Sunbeam cars took the record five times, driven by the two great rivals of the period, Henry Seagrave and Malcolm Campbell. Seagrave reached 152 miles an hour in this Sunbeam on Southport Beach. Today, it remains as fast as ever. One, six, three, point three, three. As the record-breaking cars got faster, Europe ran out of suitable sands and circuits to drive on. 174 miles an hour was the fastest speed achieved by Campbell on Pendine Sands in Wales. Seagrave and Campbell came to Florida to continue their contest, to Ormond Beach, Daytona, with its 15 miles of uninterrupted sand. Since 1903, regular speed weeks had been held here with record attempts, official and unofficial. The city's proud of its contribution to speed. Here, Seagrave was the first to beat the 200 mile an hour barrier. But it became Campbell's kingdom. Campbell, a patriotic British millionaire, devoted his life to speed. Five times he came to Daytona with his Bluebird cars and each time broke the record. He paid for his hugely expensive passion himself. The local newspaper put the bill for one visit at $100,000. In those depression years, an attempt on the land speed record was a carnival occasion. Thousands turned out to watch. They were rarely disappointed as the five-ton Bluebird with its great aeroplane engine shot by. A change of tyres and off for the return run and another record. Fifty years old by now, Campbell in four visits to Daytona raised the record to 272 miles an hour. Success brought him worldwide headlines, a meeting with the President and honour back home in Britain. On you, Captain Campbell, His Majesty the King has been pleased to bestow the honor of knighthood. Captain Campbell, your countrymen and women are proud of you. For Campbell's son, Donald, the triumph and tragedy of his own record-breaking attempts lay 30 years ahead. Thanks, old boy. I'm delighted to get back, old chap. Delighted. We, uh, conditions over there went too good. Rough beach and very bad visibility. And it was absolutely useless tying again because owing to the storms that uh, swept the coast of Florida, it wasn't likely that they'd ever get better. And therefore we backed off and came back as quick as we possibly could. Now Sir Malcolm's eyes were on 300 miles an hour and retirement. But Daytona's sand was not the surface on which to do it. In his fastest run through a measured mile, Sir Malcolm averaged 276.8 miles an hour. Nearly five miles an hour better than his previous record. Such speed reached the limits of technology, and Sir Malcolm was literally a fraction of an inch from death. 
the thickness of the bare fabric on his tires as the Bluebird ended its run. If anybody would like a real thrill, I suggest that they drive this old car at a speed of anything between 270 and 280 miles an hour, and they'll get a real kick, I can assure them of that. Campbell would finally realize his dream on the Great Salt Lake in Utah. I worship Fowler. He was a very great, dynamic, colorful man with a tremendous foresight. His courage was outstanding. I think the greatest example I ever had from him was in 1935. There was a schoolboy with him on the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah when he was the first man to reach 300. And on that first run, one of the Dunlop towers, the right-hand front one, had burst at 300 miles an hour as the car left the measured mile. And I will never forget, at the end of that run, seeing the old man by the side of that car, gaunt and silent. And I tried to talk to him, and then suddenly realized this was the wrong thing to do. The wrong thing, because I was sure in his own mind that he thought that on his return run, he was going to be killed. But that didn't daunt him and it didn't in any way affect his resolution. The Bonneville Salt Flats, remote, desolate, and so vast, you can see the curvature of the Earth on its horizon. Mile after mile of hard, flat desert make it the ideal place to drive cars to their limit. Since 1935, this has been the usual home of the land speed record. On the sun-baked surface, two Englishmen came in pursuit of Campbell's crown. George Easton, in his silver thunderbolt, a twin-engine seven-ton monster, broke the record three times, reaching 357 miles an hour. His rival was John Cobb. On the eve of the outbreak of war, Cobb snatched the record, driving a lighter car, the Railton. After the war, he returned to Bonneville and clocked up 394 miles an hour, a record no one would touch for years. The quest for speed is pursued at Bonneville to this day. For six months a year, members of speed clubs meet to put their courage and engineering skills to the test. For most of them, the speeds in the history books are merely dreams. The satisfaction here is to take a car designed and painstakingly assembled in the backyard or garage and drive it flat out. Bonneville is the ultimate. This is really the only place in the world that we can do this. It's, uh, it's a great place. Still on course. Shooting for 291, remember, hit a 234, 943 on Friday. Once you get involved in a salt flat project, it's pretty hard to walk away from it. It's kind of an addictive thing. If you look around at the people, many of them have been here for 30 years or more. And there's newcomers all the time, but the same people keep coming back year after year after year. Fools rush in. Okay. Ten years later, we still haven't gone 300. We're starting to knock on the doors. It really becomes an obsession. Uh, you talk to a lot of the racers here that uh, we'll say are new. Uh, and new could be just seven or eight or ten years they've been running. They learned about Bonneville from something, the magazines or whatever, or some friend, and they came up here probably and saw and maybe were able to work on a car or something. And usually when that happens, you've got him. He's hooked. And he'll come back every year. I mean, all of us have started like that. Now that hat's only cost me about $100,000. <laughs> and then some. The races are as different as their cars. Ken Walkie from California created the rides in Disneyland. His personal aim today is to join the 200 mile an hour club with the new front wheel drive car he designed and built himself. It performs better than he dared hope. Two hundred and sixty miles an hour, it's like a, it's like an e-ticket at Disneyland. 
It's a good e-ticket ride. It's comfortable, it's fast, it's thrilling. Gets your adrenaline up a little bit. It's good. I love it. We're in the two club, we've got ourselves a record, and uh, now we're gonna try and push it over three. So if we can make it over 300, we're really gonna be happy. In the 400 mile an hour class, one man is setting his sights even higher. After, uh, say, 15 some years of working on this car and doing it on my own, basically, in my backyard, if I could even approach that record or get close to it and, and have the luck of, of getting it, uh, it would really put a highlight on my li life, and I've always tried, and that's been one of my basic dreams, and, to get this record. And uh, it would just mean everything to me. His exit speed was very near 400 miles an hour, 399 for Al Teague out the back door. But he popped a 390, 798, he'll go into impound, and somewhere about an hour and 10 minutes from now, we'll make an attempt at a return and run. It started quite a few years ago when Campbell first came up here in 1935, and then was followed by Ilston, and then Cobbs, and then the uh, Summer Brothers, and then Donald Campbell, more or less. Uh, not exactly in that order, but uh, I uh, rank very, uh, privilege to have my name with those names if I do set the world land speed record and so far we're about 10 miles an hour off of it so we're going to keep trying and keep in there and maybe one of these days we can do it. In August 1991 Al Teague's dream came true almost his speedomotive streamliner reached 432 miles an hour making him the fastest man ever in a wheel driven vehicle and luckily his average speed wasn't enough to gain the official record. Cobb's 394 mile an hour record turned out to be a tough target to beat. It stood for 13 years before a new contender came forward, Sir Malcolm Campbell's son Donald in a newly built Bluebird. Unlike most American attempts, no expense was spared. The bill for the project would end up costing a million pounds and Campbell himself nearly paid for it with his life. Of course, the first, the first record attempt he did on land was a complete fiasco. We, we went to Bonneville in 1960, and the wheels hit the side, soft salt, which was lying on the side, and spun, and of course, when you're doing 300 miles per hour and over, it, there's no way, I mean, you have no hope. And of course, the car turned over and fell seven times. And we got by the car when he was being lifted out of the cockpit and he looked absolutely like a piece of rag, you know, had broken ribs, a broken skull. And he looked at me and he winked and he whispered something to the highway patrolman, which was actually later I was told, don't let her come in the car with me, let her be in the front because he was frightened that he'd die. I'd be there, and he didn't want me to see him like that. So I was pushed into the front of the ambulance. He was in the back, and the hospital was in Tuella, which is a two-hour drive, and suddenly there was a knock on that little window that's behind, you know, where he was, and I opened it up, and the highway patrolman and the nurse who were with him said, your husband is sending you a message. The family chores are all right. <laughs> Even then, you know, it's unbelievable. I have survived the fastest crash that the, um, mankind has ever survived. It took four more frustrating years before Donald Campbell beat Cobb's record. He did it in Australia on Lake Eyre in 1964 with a speed of 403 miles an hour the first man officially to pass the 400 mark. But by now, the mighty wheel-driven bluebird was a dinosaur. Back on the salt flats, Craig Breedlove, with his unofficial jet engine car, had already reached 407 miles an hour. 
the transformation of the land speed record had begun. Jet power did away with the troublesome business of driving a car through its wheels. The thrust of its engine literally propelled it across the salt. Soon Breedlove and his art rival Art Arfons were shattering the old records. The self-taught Arfons built the Green Monster in his backyard in Ohio. Breedlove, in a new version of the Spirit of America, Sonic One, was the first man to pass 500, then 600 miles an hour. As the two battled it out, another American, Bob Summers, drove his elegant goldenrod to a new wheel-driven record of 409 miles an hour. Enter Blue Flame, Gary Gablich's rocket car, specially built to take the record. With an engine fueled by an explosive mixture of hydrogen peroxide and natural gas, he blasted his pencil-like car to 622 miles an hour. For nearly 10 years, the world of land speed records lay quiet. and the launch of the astonishing Budweiser rocket. It came with a Sidewinder missile attached to propel it through the sound barrier. Its driver was Stan Barrett. The Sidewinder was something that I really didn't want to use. Uh, I really didn't even want to test it because it was, uh, I mean, you've got a Sidewinder missile sitting an inch from the back of your head and it's bolted in there and I said, has anybody ever fired one of these before on a car? He said, no. I said, well, <laughs> I kept having visions of me firing the button and that sidewinder comes shooting through and taking my head off. But uh, I mean, I, I didn't know what was going to keep, uh, keep this thing from um, coming on through, how they secured it. The car feels like it's going to explode any second. It's screaming and it, the vibrations and so on. You th the noise is incredible in the car. And you think it's going to blow up any minute. You think it's just going to go in a million pieces. Then when I hit the sidewinder, you pull another G of acceleration. And uh, it, at that speed, it's just an incredible feeling. I mean, I don't really like to even think about that feeling because you want to have it again. Stan reached 739 miles an hour, but he was timed only over 62 feet by unauthorized radar and in one direction. It was never officially recognized and no one heard the sonic boom. So what's it like driving cars at these phenomenal speeds? I can remember, you know, looking up at the welds that I'd put into the roll bar system, all of the screws that I'd put in the windshield and when you build these cars, I mean, you know, nobody does it to you. You did it to yourself, and I, you know, you're sitting in this, this machine, and you're you're wondering if you've constructed a coffin for yourself at that point. It's a bit like driving on ice, and the reason for that is that, that the tires become less and less in contact with the ground. They literally hit the high places, and they're airborne over the low ones. And uh, about 375, you begin to experience the phenomenon, and then by the time you hit 600, the tires have literally no control over the car whatsoever. It's basically um, a ground-borne aircraft. The Americans, with their rockets and jets, had monopolized the land speed record since the mid-60s. Then in 1977, an English businessman, Richard Noble, set out to win it back. It took him and his team six years. Then, one October day in 1983, not on the Salt Flats, but at the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, he officially became the fastest man on Earth in his car, Thrust 2. To put it very simply, Thrust 2 is purely a jet-powered car. It's like a trolley with a hairdryer on the end, okay, which pushes it forward. It's very, very powerful. Um, normally a conventional road car is, perhaps has got something of the order of um, 70 horsepower and, and a weight of about a tonne, so 70 horsepower per tonne. This has got 30,000 horsepower, right, and it weighs four tonnes, so in other words, 7,000 horsepower per tonne. It's, um, and it goes like, goes like a rocket, literally. Um, it's, the power-to-weight ratio is twice that of, of a lightning fighter, so a light accelerator, lightning fighter. 
Um, it has to do that because basically you've got to build up that speed over a short distance. You've got to get up to 650 miles an hour, okay, over a very short distance, which is just seven miles. So you've got to really, you've got to really, really go for it. From the cockpit, you can see huge shock waves sitting up on the intake and over the wheel arches and so on as it goes supersonic and is going to part. And the best run of all was the second and last when we went from naught to, um, to 650 miles an hour in 59 seconds. Having got to number one in the world, your problem then is you've succeeded yourself out of business. What we've got to have is somebody, another nation, whether it's the Japanese or the Americans or the French or somebody, come back and take that record. And then we can build number three, which, which is what I think we'd all like to do. Record attempts are addictive. Breedlove plans a comeback. Teague won't give up on the wheel-driven record. For some men, speed is a disease. A disease for which there's no cure. It's a very uh, lonely feeling. You're, you're, you're on your own. Uh, there's no one there to help you. And when it's over, it's, it, uh, it kind of lets you down. I, I experienced some depression afterwards, and of course, uh, all of a sudden, you now have something to lose. Uh, and I think it's uh, maybe difficult to uh, be satisfied with other types of things in your life. I mean, they become somewhat boring after you've done something as intense as go for a world speed record.